everybody, can you hear me? I, I usually don't speak very loud, so if you don't, please let me know. Well, my name is Jorge Torres, and I'm a co-founder of MindCB. And we are a fully open source project. Um, so investors, if you hear the previous talk, try to ignore that. We will try to survive as open source. Um, OK, so the talk is about democratizing machine learning and why we think that is important. And what is important to do that, as well as trying to convince you to join us. Um, so why machine learning? And this may be obvious to many of you. And before we continue, I would like to know how many of you have worked uh, making some machine learning to some extension? And how many of you consider yourselves machine learning experts? There you go. Um, and the truth is that being a machine learning expert is, is it takes years of practice and fine tuning. And, um, and it is also hard to become obsolete. You know, you may be, might have been a machine learning expert a few years ago, and it moves so fast that it's, it's just overwhelming. But the power of machine learning is, I mean, obvious now. And people want to use machine learning because they want to make more informed predictions given the data that they have. And this is very powerful because we shouldn't be making predictions based on our gut feeling. Even though it's important to take it into account, it, you know, we should have data-driven decisions. Um, but there is this huge demand of machine learning predictions because we have this overgrown capacity to collect data and organize data and structure data, but we have this kind of like bottleneck on the machine learning expert to build these predictions. And uh, more important than that is that the people who are demanding these predictions are usually the domain experts. Uh, this is people that have been building systems or work in an industry for many, many years and they are the ones that really want to get these predictions, but they rely on the capacity of the machine learning not only to be the machine learning expert, but also to be the domain expert. And this is very dangerous. I myself, I have worked building machine learning models for healthcare, and I barely know the name of the bones. So it doesn't really matter if you are a machine learning expert. If you're not the domain expert, you're really introducing a lot of risk into your predictions. And of course, what we believe is the way to go this is to provide and build machine learning tools that enable people that are not necessarily machine learning uh, domain experts, but are domain experts in many other fields. And Python is beautiful because it allows people from many, many different disciplines to be developers. And you know, developer is a very broad term, but you can learn how to code in Python very quickly and get up to speed as you desire. And what we want to enable first is precisely that people. And the reason why we think that even though we want to empower everyone to use machine learning to get predictions from their data, uh, developers have this very interesting aspect to machine learning. And is that to do machine learning, you have to fit in data. And if you're a developer, you at least have the tool set to collect, aggregate, and manipulate the data and then fit it to the machine learning engine. And of course, machine learning uh, is only one cog within the whole system that you're building. And developers have this beautiful power of building stuff. And machine learning should just be one tool, not the end goal. So how do we do this? Well, machine learning has many different steps. And once you do it over and over, it becomes kind of uh, easy to see the patterns and it's mechanical. And we want to abstract that mechanics so that it is very simple for people that want to use their data and make predictions and not really think about the mechanics behind it. So what is really important if we want to democratize machine learning? And we want to delegate this to a system that builds and automates the machine learning machinery. Well, if you are delegating stuff that makes decisions um, to a system, you want to get explanations for this system. It cannot be a black box. So there is a trade-off. You can automate the mechanics, but on the, on the other hand, you really have to get sound explanations that either validate or uh, challenge your intuitions. So explainability has to be the next big thing on people that are building machine learning systems. And this is the invitation that we want to make. So if you are working in machine learning or you're a machine learning expert, trying to think more of how do you generalize your solutions and then how do you make them interpretable and explainable? So, the rest of our talk is going to be more about our approach. And we invite everyone really to take this approach of building generalized solutions for machine learning rather than building concept solutions. And we will just walk you through the one that we took. Uh, 
as we said, is open source, so you can install MyZB with a pip install MyZB. Um, and we are evolving quite fast, so we get a lot of feedback from the community. It's very early on, and we're about to release a new version, uh, the version 1.0. So if you want early access to this, feel free to find me somewhere. Um, or Ami, she's, uh, well, find us here, and we'll be happy to give you early access. Um, so the basic building blocks of MyZB are driven by three goals that we want to make sure that they kind of prevail across all the different versions that we have. The first one is that it has to be frictionless. And the reason for this is that we really want to enable uh, developers in a way so that it feels very intuitive and it has to be the least work or effort possible. And for us, that goal is that you can implement, regardless of how complex it is in the backend, a machine learning model with one line of code and that you can use it with one line of code. The second one is that it has to be explainable. And of course, this is a path that we're walking now, um, and it will continue to evolve. And I'll walk you through the details of the explainability level that we have at the moment. But that is crucial to democratizing machine learning, as I explained. So it has to answer four or five basic questions. The first one is, if you get a prediction, you should not only get that prediction, but really be able to understand why that prediction and not something else. The second one is, if you have a model, you want to know when you can actually trust the model and when you can't, because not all models work the same. And as you train models, you really understand that it may not be a problem of the model, but rather the data that you fit into it. So you also have to understand what you can do to improve the accuracy that you're getting and really when you can trust it. If you have a system that tells you that someone is gonna develop cancer, you really wanna know when this is actually accurate and when you can't and why. And the third one is that, you know, what was uh, fashion three months ago in machine learning is not today. It moves really fast. And if we're going to abstract this complexity, we also want to abstract the evolution of this complexity. So you don't really have to think about it. You think about the data that you have and what other data you can collect. And then it is our job to really try to keep it up to state. And with those three principles, um, well, I really invite you to go and try it. But also, uh, well, I want to talk to you about a little bit more of what we're doing. Uh, I thought I had uh, a little bit fewer time. I was running through the presentation because um, I was speaking a little bit faster. But anyway, let me walk you through what is coming this month. So the uh, intention of what we're doing right now, based on the things that we've learned with the previous iterations of MyZB, is, well, let's make the API that we provide for people a little bit cleaner. And I'll explain the principle behind it. Also, support many more data types. The reason that MyZB uh, was created is that we really understand that once you want to predict something, it ultimately translates into you have a table and you have a few columns that you want to predict and then you have the columns that you're learning from. Now, how you build this table is you, you know, uh, up to you, but ultimately you just, at the end, transform your data into like some inputs and then some targets. And um, we're just now into the task of supporting many more data types of the columns that you want to predict. And also, the thing that we want to provide people in this new version is that rather than having something that works in your, in your desktop, that you can move from whatever you're prototyping into production rather quick. So the first change that we made is that uh, as opposed to just having something that you can train locally, uh, we created an object that is a predictor and it's an object that you can move around. So if you train a predictor in one computer, then you can move it around multiple computers, uh, just read in the cloud or even an embedded device. The second thing is that uh, initially we were working with tables that only had like numeric and categorical values. And now you can have many more. You can have numeric, you can have categorical, you can have dates, you can have binary such as images, video, audio, and you can have sequential data. And you can also do time series, so a combination of those. And we are starting to pioneer into the explainability side. So right now, if you have a predictor, you can ask it to explain the quality. And we believe that in order to really explain what's going on, you really have to start by the quality of the different states of your prediction. So you really want to understand if you have a model or a predictor to explain to you the quality of that predictor, not only when it is accurate, but why. And the second one is if you have a prediction also to get an insight into the quality of that prediction. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what this quality means. The first thing that you want to analyze is the data that you provide to a machine learning model. 
And that is the thing that we do. So when you provide my, uh, MyZB with some data, it will run through this data and try to assess the quality of the data across a few dimensions. The first one is consistency, you know, is, is there a lot of error in your data? And before we even start building a model, just try to get rid of those errors and make you aware of that. The second one is redundancy, is there a lot of stuff that is repeated that is not necessary either by columns or by rows, and also try to get rid of this so that your model is simpler. And then it talks about variability. Is there stuff that you can actually learn from due to a lot of variation, not that much variation? Are there biases in your data? And this is crucial. Biases is something that we really want to dive into because when you have data, you're intrinsically just teaching something to learn from that data. And if that data is biased, then your results are going to be biased. And it is really your responsibility to show you when there are biases in your data. And ultimately, how complete is your data? so that we can just kind of like inform you of things that it may not be able to learn just because you don't have it. Lastly, the model quality is if there are regions of the prediction space where you're actually, or what you're trying to predict that the model is not really being able to learn, uh, to point back into the data quality insights that we found and tell you what we think is the main reason why it's not learning those. Ultimately, when you get a prediction, our goal is not that you just get a prediction, but if you want, you get to have an explanation. And the best thing for us is to try by giving you a distribution of what your possible predictions can be, and we're just giving you the most likely, and then tell you about why that distribution behaves the way that it does. Uh, the next thing is to be able to make MyZB so that you can move it to production. So essentially you have uh, the MyZB PIP module, we're wrapping that into a server that we're providing for you as well. So if you do MyZB and pip install MyZB server, now it's something that you can actually deploy. And as I was telling you, you can train something, move that object around either into a server or into an embedded device. But if you have it in a server, you can expose it. And now we have SDKs. Um, so we can plug this into web applications, whatnot. We're providing you with a simple uh, graphical interface. I can show you a little bit about how that is going to look like. Um, but it is quite trivial. You have data sets um, and data sets from which you want to predict something. So this is a data set of real estate and you want to predict the price of a real estate uh, asset. Um, and then from that, what MyZB does, it, it will try to get some statistical understanding of the data that you have, break it into what are the transformations that it has to make to each of the columns, build the proper vector representation for each of the columns that you have, and then once you have vector representation for all the columns, see how you can aggregate them and fit them into you know, a few kind of neural networks that can actually deal with this uh, vector representation and then get to the target. Um, and then it will just try to like do this with a few candidates until it gets the one that has the highest accuracy, and then it will try to show you, you know, where the model is performing well and when it's not. Um, this will take a while, we'll come back to it. Uh, but that's kind of like the uh, essence of what we're trying to provide. We really invite you to come to us if you are looking to contribute into a project. We do have uh, funding, University of uh, UC Berkeley uh, invested in us as well as other people that believe in you can actually make a open source project that can find its way into being uh, profitable. Uh, for us, that is being able to provide this tool to as many people as possible. And then there will be intrinsic complexities in terms of scalability and problems that really have to deal with uh, the dimensionality of your data, uh, such as like banks and other types of corporations that can actually pay for it. So we want to provide it for free for as many people as possible and then really tap into those industries that really have very precise needs where we can actually make a revenue out of. Um, well, this is it. Uh, I have one last uh, graph to show you as to how it works. Essentially, you build a vector representation of each of your columns and then you have candid neural networks as to what would be the predictive model that you have once you have those vector representations. And it will you try them all, and at the end, that's a predictor that we give you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this is questions time. Thank you, Jorge. And uh, the question 
that we have at, at the top? What kinds of data types do you support? Yeah. Um, so for the version that you see right now on uh, GitHub and PyPy, you only, we only support numeric and categorical. What we're releasing this month uh, has numeric, categorical, date, binary, and within binary, we support images, audio, and we're thinking about releasing video. It depends on our uh, capacity to move as fast as we want to, as well as sequential data, and that is kind of like being able to mix this data into time series information, um, and also text, which is sequential by nature. Machine learning and artificial intelligence is not only about, about predictions, but also about classification or decision making. Is MindsDB able to solve or work with these aspects of ML AI? Yeah, so your target can be any of those as well. And again, uh, uh, prediction is, uh, it, like let's say you're, you're classifying something, that is a prediction, it's just that it's a categorical prediction. So, so long your target is any of these variables, then you can do it. So the input or the output can be any of those, and it can be a combination of those. Um, I hope that answers the question that we had. Um, how can you tell that the data is biased? Yeah, well, there are different techniques that allow you to identify uh, based on the variance of your data and your input variables. If uh, the distribution is kind of like rightly leaning into some values, then, you know, it's biased towards that. Let's say you're trying to classify people with cancer and without cancer, but most of your data is with people that have cancer. Then, of course, your algorithm will be biased towards uh, saying that it has cancer. Um, there are other methodologies, and this is kind of like what we're developing at the moment. But right now, a lot of our um, heuristics are based on the variances on the data that you have. How transparent is this approach? Can I access stuff under the hood and see what's actually going on? Yeah, so uh, this predictor that you can import and export is actually a zip file. And then you can open it and dive into like the different components that we built. What does XAI stand for? Explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, and, you know, artificial intelligence is kind of like this wishy-washy term that people kind of hate, but uh, the, the XAI is kind of like the term that is catching on. Into it. If you're building a AI or machine learning system, it has to be explainable, and that's where it comes from. Building a good machine learning model usually involves understanding the data, the math behind the model, and smartly done pre-processing. Is this possible with MindsDB? So we do a lot of the pre-processing uh, that is necessary to once you have your data into like a table. Um, how you transform your original data into a table, it's right now up to you. And in later versions, we'll be working into ETLing and kind of like do aggregation and whatnot and facilitating that part. Uh, but at the moment, it does require that somehow you can build a table of all your data. And then of that table, you tell us what you want to predict. Um, but we will be working on the data transformation. Yeah. And the next one, you partly touched on this already, but maybe you can elaborate, elaborate a little more. How can I contribute? Yeah, so um, if you want, you can join the open source project. We also have uh, some budget to hire people, so feel free to reach out to us if you want to work with us. And um, as well as spreading the word, trying it, giving feedback, we have had more than 20 or 30,000 pip installs at the moment, and we are getting so much feedback from people, and that's how we evolved into like from version previous to 1.0 to 1.0, and we would like to do the same for the subsequent version. So even if you just try it and give us feedback, that will be very helpful. So install, use it, and if possible, contribute feedback yeah. or code. Uh -huh. um, does MindsDB also visualize results? Yes. Uh, so this still is still training, but. Uh, Part of the explainability part is to be able to determine those parts where the model is working and not working, and then being able to point out to those uh, quality issues that we see in your data that may lead to the model not learning what it is supposed to be learning. But um, a lot of the work that we'll be doing in the next quarter is mostly around visualization and explainability. And the final question, what about unsupervised machine learning problems? We don't work on those yet, um, but we, of course, want to. That is a, a problem at bandwidth. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to move with prediction and this kind of like this architecture that is multiple blocks, so you have a server, is that we can plug streams of data. And once you can pipe streams of data, then you can kind of like try to understand patterns of the stream of data and not only get insights, but also try to predict the, the stream itself.
And there is our last question. Thank you so much, Jorge. Yeah.